just a couple. I just want to con announce a couple of uh, upcoming events. On Monday, July the 12th at 6 p.m., Ace Atkins uh, will, will be with us with uh, his new Quinn Colson novel, The Heathens. And he's going to be in conversation with Jack Pendarvis at the Old Armory Pavilion here in Oxford. Bring your chair, your picnic basket, et cetera. Tate Moore is going to play a little music, and that should be a fun event. On Thursday, July 15, Elizabeth Gonzalez James will be discussing her debut paperback novel, Mona at Sea, with Galadriel Allman, uh, who some of you may recall from her 2014 book about her father, Dwayne Allman. Uh, in the last two weeks of July, we'll host six events, six more events, and you can find out more about those at squarebooks.com. Uh, so thanks for uh, joining us for another Crossroads event, um, the book discussion program that we initiated after the George Floyd uh, murder. I'm very excited about today's event uh, for a book that's uh, so very well suited uh, with this effort. Uh, when the stars begin to fall, overcoming racism and renewing the promise of America. Uh, the author is our featured guest today, Theodore R. Johnson. He goes by Ted Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson is a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law, a commander in the U.S. Navy. He was a White House fellow in the first Obama administration and speechwriter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. staff. Uh, his work on race relations has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and other publications. Uh, Ted, we're uh, so very happy to have you quote here today. I hope uh, sometime, sometime in the future you can find your way to Mississippi and Square Books. I owe you dinner. <laughs> Sounds uh, good to me. <laughs> I quickly want to acknowledge the book's publisher, Atlantic Monthly Press, and the editor there, George Gibson, uh, who first mentioned this book uh, to me very excitedly and sent it to me, uh, suggesting this event, which I immediately agreed was a keen idea. And the first person I thought of who might uh, be a good host uh, is an old friend, the former governor of Mississippi and secretary of the Navy during the Obama administration, Ray Mavis, a person who has always endeavored to blaze the path for the better, more color conscious society that Ted Johnson sets forward here in this book. Uh, Ray, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, guest, I want to remind you to feel free to submit questions in the Q&A and when they get through toward the end of their discussion, we'll, we'll uh, try to answer, have them answer some of those questions. Square Books is so very honored to be able to help promote this book with these two fine men, and I look forward to your discussion. Ray, I turn it over to you. All right. Well, to my lifelong friend, Richard Holworth, uh, and to Square Books, and uh, Ted, I would highly recommend that you go by, hit Richard up for a free meal almost every time I'm in Oxford. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm too very honored to be doing this um, with um, with Ted Johnson, and um, as Richard said, uh, a 20 year Navy vet uh, who has done some of the in this book some of the best writing about uh, systemic racism and the problem of racism in America that I've that I've ever read. Uh, it's an incredibly well-written book. And I wanted to start out, uh, you talk about uh, just how insidious racism is. And if we don't solve it, we have very little chance of solving any of the other major issues facing this country, like economic inequality and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you, the whole first part of the book talks about um, about your experiences, about your family's experiences, about others' experiences doing, uh, and and how America has, in large part, tried to move past uh, a color conscious society because they say, well, we've we've had the civil rights revolution, we've had executive orders, we've elected and reelected a black president. Um, now racism is just a problem with a few bad apples. Um, and, and you, in, in great detail, 
explain why that's not the case and why we will never live up to America's promise unless we do that. Um, and then at the end of the book, you offer a solution um, in a very comprehensive solution to regaining America's promise. And I guess my question to you is, after all you've been through, after all your family's been through, after all America's been through, you're still very optimistic that, uh, that we can do this. And I'm just not sure I'm that optimistic. And I just um, wanted to mm-hmm. wanted to get your take on, on why and how you think uh, this optimism is, is warranted. Yeah, so uh, thank you um, to, to Square Books for having me. And thank you, Sec- Secretary Mavis, for, for moderating this and for the question. And it's one that I have been fielding a, a bit over the last several weeks. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy answer. I, I am very optimistic that the nation has a path out of the turmoil of today, uh, that we have a path out of uh, a place in, in which racism distorts what the promise of America is and, and could be. What, what I'm not sure of is if we're up to the moment, if we're up to the challenge. Um, what's clear is that racism is a threat to the nation, has been since its inception. Uh, the one distinction I wanna call out up front is that when I say racism is a, an existential threat to America, I am talking about the American idea. Uh, we, we know based on American history, on US history, that we have been through times in our, our national life where racism was accepted, state sanctioned, and was a way of life in our society and the nation grew stronger over time despite the fact that it wasn't living up to its principles. So the nation state, the geopolitical entity we call the United States can live with racism and our history has shown it, maybe not comfortably at all times, but but it has shown that it can do so. But the idea of America, the idea that we are all created equal, the idea that we have unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the ideas that are encapsulated in our Bill of Rights and all the other amendments, uh, especially the post-Civil War ones, none of those things can coexist with the idea of racial inequality. So either racism prevails and the American idea collapses on itself, or the idea prevails and we finally overcome the effects of structural racism in our country. Um, The optimism I have, uh, despite all evidence to the contrary, is really grounded in my upbringing in the the black church. I was raised in North Carolina. My mother was from Southwest Georgia, my father from South Carolina. And they come from a tradition where um, you keep the faith even when everything you're looking at in your daily existence tells you to give up hope or that there is nothing ahead for you that would suggest you will ever touch the, 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 uh, the liberty and the freedom that the nation promises. The, even the title of this book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, it comes from an, an old Negro spiritual that is uh, ostensibly about the day that all the believers are sent to heaven um, And in in actuality, what those enslaved Black folks were singing about was emancipation, the the desire for freedom and liberty, things they could not sing openly about while enslaved on plantations. So they cloaked their desire for emancipation and liberty in Christian theology as a way of singing their heart's desire in a way that was permissible. Even, and so this is the kind of optimism and faith that undergirds this book, the same kind of optimism and faith that helped people persevere through the worst of the, the nation's history, through the worst of conditions, and believe in this country anyway, and fight for it to, to, uh, to push it a little bit closer to its promise. Right, well, in this, this roadmap you lay out, the path that we, whether we're up to it or not, mm. um, you know, you had a, a bunch of points, a bunch of things you thought needed to happen, reforming democracy, civic education, um, engage, a more engaged democracy, and one that's particularly dear to me, national service. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I've been for national service for as long as I can remember. When I was in the Navy uh, 50 years ago, I met people there, had to deal with people there, that I even that I've never met since then, and I've met literally hundreds of thousands of people since then. Uh, and you know this notion of 
doing something bigger than yourself, the notion of learning teamwork and leadership. Um, but if you could just briefly, how do these things fit together? And how do you, how do you see, uh, and, and you, know, you, you talk about needing a transformational figure, a single person maybe. Um, and in this time of instant communication and just anonymous trolling on social media, yeah. Um, how do you how do you see it getting done? How do you, how do you see um, America coming together, not to be the same, but to be different, but united in a in a common purpose for the American idea? Right, right. So, and so the the book calls for a national solidarity that would bring Americans together across difference, racial, ethnic difference, religious differences, custom, cultural differences and unite us behind the promise of America, which are the, the, the ideals and principles inscribed in our, our declaration in our constitution. Uh, and so at the end of the book, I sketch out five things that would be conducive to the arising of this national solidarity. The first is democracy reform, and that is reforming our institutions, our processes, our systems to be more inclusive and encourage participation by citizens in our democratic processes, not just every four years when the presidential election happens, but in every democratic process from the localities, our school boards, all the way up through the presidency to stay engaged uh, routinely instead of um, you know, every two or four years when national elections happen. So I think we need to reform those, those processes and institution systems in order to be more inclusive and more fair and just. The second thing I say is civic education. This is not just about Americans knowing how many branches of government there are or knowing where the congressperson is. This is about educating people to be active citizens in a liberal democracy. And all of the things that comes with not just paying taxes and voting, but in every way engaged in the democratic process to include engaging your fellow citizens, deliberating on policy ideas with them, coming to conclusions based on consensus agreements, and then holding government accountable for, for the, the will of, to the will of the people. The third thing is deliberative democracy. Uh, and some of that is touched on um, in order to, uh, to create the kind of governance that we want, the people have to come together to deliberate on items and we can't abdicate that responsibility to just those that we elect to represent us, uh, deliberation has to be a way of life in a democracy. So deliberative democracy is, is a call for that. National service, uh, as you outlined, is so important. And again, military service is, uh, is, is a beautiful window into the potential of national service to break down barriers between Americans who may not have met one another otherwise and bring us together, expose ourselves to one another so that we can work together for common cause for the nation that we all want or the vast majority of us want, which is one that lives up to these principles. And then the fifth is a transformational figure. And this is sort of like the citizen exemplar who models what it, what a good principled citizen looks like so that we don't, it, it, the, the idea of a of a, uh, a, a realized American citizen isn't abstract or theoretical, but we've got flesh and bones that we can look to for to model what that looks like. And I think every generation has those folks. Sometimes we recognize them in the moment, sometimes afterwards. But look, all of these five things are really structured to do one thing. And that one thing is to create civic friendships among democratic strangers. We are a nation of 330 million people. We will never get to know one another intimately. Um, our social circles, we have self-segregated ourselves. So uh, something like three and four Americans don't have a single person of another race in their immediate social circle, whether in real life or on social media. So we don't know one another. And when we don't know one another, it becomes easy for those who would look to exploit racial tensions for political expedience to caricature other groups and say they you know they're trying to destroy the country they're trying to replace you they're trying to disrupt the culture and though if we don't know one another we can't be resilient to those appeals as we would be otherwise this is something the, the beauty of the military as you mentioned is that i worked alongside people from iowa i would never meet from california from Washington State, from Puerto Rico, folks, different races of religions, ethnicities, but we were all working together in service of the country. And that is the beauty of America. And so all of these programs are meant to expose us to one another and these large um, uh, deliberative 
pro-democracy, service-oriented convenings so that we uh, will be more resilient to the appeals that others uh, are making to divide us. And only through exposure and experience other folks will be able to do that. Okay. Um, we've been talking a little bit about the military. You've got a long military background. I had the privilege of being the Secretary of the Navy and the Marines, as they point out. Um, right. for, for, for eight years. Um, the military has been in the press lately, you know, uh, particularly General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who got attacked in congressional testimony because um, our military academies are teaching um, critical race theory. Um, the, his, his commander's book list um, included books um, about racism in America. And um, I mean, to me, one of, the, one of the very surest ways to know that systemic racism exists and that it is, has not dissipated, it has not disappeared in any meaningful way is that a bunch of people don't want folks to learn about it um, and that, uh, you know, and that they're going to huge links. I mean, people didn't know they had a problem with something called critical race theory. Uh, and to me, it's one of these um, look over here, right. don't look over there. Um, don't look over the fact that we can't govern. Don't look over the fact that we're not solving any problems. Look at this made up issue uh, right. that, um, but we don't want you to learn about the, the history of America. We don't want you to learn about what so many of our citizens have gone through and are still going through. We don't want you to learn about anything like this. And I thought that General Milley gave a pretty good answer. Um, but you've served for 20 years in the military. The military has been held up as, some, as, a, as an organization that has got done pretty well on, on race, but in truth, there's still a long, long way to go in the military. And, uh, you know, we keep hearing, and, and I'll get to the question, we keep hearing that um, if you do this sort of thing, it will disrupt unit cohesion. Right. If you do this sort of thing, it will hurt morale. Well, this is the same just absolutely BS reasons that people gave for not integrating the military in the 40s, for um, not repealing don't ask, don't tell, uh, for keeping women out of all jobs. Uh, and every time it has just been totally, absolutely, completely wrong. Yeah. And they know it is. Um, but talk a little bit about your experience in the military and how you see the military is both something that can operate as a as an example, but also a military that that still needs to to make a lot of strides in this area. Yeah, it's um, it's it's such a great question, and um, so many directions I could go um, with it. I, I think you're just sort of talking about General Milley. I agree with you that his answer was good. Uh, he is the chairman of a force that is one third people of color. Um, Black Americans are overrepresented in, in the armed services. And so it is good, it is good commanding for a, the general um, responsible for these, these service members to want to understand the lives that those service members have both inside the military and then uh, when they go home or the lives that their families have. And General Milley said, you know, what is so wrong with trying to understand um, the racism in America? What, what's so bad about that? There was a, uh, I can't remember the philosopher's name or the strategist's name, maybe it was Sir Francis Bacon who said that um, the country that will insist on drawing a broad line of demarcation between its thinking man and its fighting man will find its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. And so uh, military leaders must have curious minds if they're going to protect the nation to which they've dedicated their lives to do. Uh, just as you mentioned, when Truman decided to desegregate the federal workforce in 48 and the military in 1948, uh, a lot of people outside of the military and in the military 
felt that this was a social experiment, the military was no, no place for it, that it would be disruptive to society and to our war fight, fighting mission, and it wasn't. It wasn't, uh, and it proved to be the leading edge of two decades of racial progress that included making uh, separate but equal unconstitutional and Brown v. Board that included multiple Civil Rights Act of 57 and uh, 1964, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, and even presidents like Eisenhower sending in the 101st Airborne into Little Rock, Arkansas to desegregate the, uh, the high school there. And Eisenhower was no uh, died in the wool racial progressive, but he was a president who recognized the authority of certain institutions and the, and the importance of the rule of law. And so because the Supreme Court had ruled this, he did his constitutional duty to enforce that, that, that ruling. That's the kind of principled leadership that we need uh, in order to get ourselves to, to move forward from where we are today. I will say my 20 years and nine months or so in the military, it is the place where I realize opportunities I don't think I would have touched elsewhere in, in the country. It has uh, presented benefits in terms of medical, uh, school, housing benefits that have allowed me to get ahead in ways that would not have been possible if I hadn't joined the military. Um, for me, coming out of college and going to officer candidate school, it was a rite of passage into manhood. Uh, I felt like my parents had done lots to get me off to a good start. The military was supposed place where they couldn't help me become a man. They couldn't help me serve the country. This was something I had to do from my own gut, from my own heart, and I became a man in the military. And yet, uh, I, I've in the military with the same brothers and sisters that I have fought alongside and served alongside, deployed alongside, I've also experienced, uh, you know, being accused of being a, an affirmative action handout when I was promoted early to lieutenant commander or uh, selected to the White House Fellowship and, you know, the, my, the, the commander beside me said, you know, how much of this is because you're black and we have a black president. So the military is a cross section of society. What we find in our society, we will find remnants of that in the military. But it's uh, the, the superordinate mission the military has. It's highly regulated and norm uh, and, and normative culture that uh, uh, believes people's um, their hard work should be rewarded uh, in terms of promotions and job responsibility. That creates a an environment where you can thrive in ways there that uh, aren't necessarily as open to you outside of the military. So there are pros and cons there. There are good good parts and bad parts. But on the whole, there is a lot that the military, uh, that the nation could learn from the military in terms of service, as well as, as multiracial sort of egalitarian um, culture. But there is a lot that the military as an institution can learn from our society in terms of sort of surrendering some of the traditional ways of doing business and uh, and sort of uh, advancing with the times. Well, last question before I know Richard is going to come back in with uh, questions from from the audience. But uh, you're speaking to a bookstore located in Oxford, Mississippi, where Ole Miss is. 101st Airborne was also sent into Oxford, mm. Mississippi, in 1962 when James Meredith integrated um, integrated Ole Miss, and there was a riot. Uh, two people were killed. Uh, and, you know, Mississippi has this incredibly awful record on civil rights. Uh, everything from the assassination of Major Evers to the murder of the three civil rights workers to being in the forefront of Jim Crow laws. And, um, and, and even now, you know, trying to suppress voting and um, making health care unequal and education unavailable and, uh, and resegregated and, and unequal. Uh, when I ran for governor in 1987, which is hard for me to believe it's been that long ago, <laughs> uh, but I really believed that Mississippi could lead the country in racial reconciliation mm -hmm. because we were too small to be geographically segregated. People knew each other. People relied on each other. People, um, you know, if, if you, you know, if you go to a restaurant today in Oxford or Jackson, or almost any Mississippi city, it's far more integrated than if you go in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. or New York. Um, but um, what do you say to people who have sort of lost hope? because 
it didn't happen when the when the laws when the Jim Crow laws were swept aside. It didn't happen when schools were integrated. Um, it didn't happen when de jure segregation was done away with. That um, it it for a brief moment it looked very possible, mm -hmm. but then um, and and this is I mean I've been in politics most of my life, but when one party figured out that if they got all the white votes and the other party got all the black votes, they won every time. Um, and, you know, I never ran a campaign that uh, race wasn't an issue. Uh, but what do you say to people that, you know, you had this brief moment that you thought we could seize and it seems to have slipped away. How do we regain that or, uh, or can we? Yeah. No, it's, it's tough. And I mean, I think the, the straightforward answer is whenever there is progress, we will reach an inflection point where we can either continue that progress or take steps backward to try to recapture or, or groups to recapture what was lost. Sometimes we've taken that step forward and made very difficult decisions to force the nation to be better. Many times we've taken the step backwards and, and, and have now we have to retry ground that we thought we had already figured out uh, because of that backsliding. Um, look, when uh, President Johnson addressed the joint se session of Congress before the Voting Rights Act was signed, he said, there is no Negro problem in America. There is no Southern problem in America. There is an American problem. And that is uh, when it comes to the issue of race, we haven't managed to figure out how to create a racially equal society. Uh, race becomes the thing that gets weaponized and turned into a, a cudgel uh, by which, you know, one side tends to beat the other side over the head with. But just as there were those incidents in Mississippi, um, in places like Boston and, and Delaware, where busing was, was being introduced, there were riots breaking out at Capitol and the State Assembly in those places as a rejection of racial integration. And so I, I think one that um, a lot of our the, our discussions about history in the United States tends to try to cordon off uh, race as a problem only in the former slaveholding states in the deep, deep South as if everyone else has it figured out. And that's not true. And so once we recognize that this is an American problem, I think that opens our aperture a little bit to what's possible. The other thing is, I think the, the Deep South is the future of American democracy will go the way the Deep South goes. And I, there are green shoots of, of that, of a good democracy happening in the South and cities like Charlotte and Birmingham and Jackson, Mississippi and Atlanta, you have black mayors in these places that would have never had black uh, leadership and certainly not at the city level, um, you know, some 70, 80 years ago. Uh, Mississippi just changed its flag and, and, and South Carolina pulled down its, its uh, flag from the state house. Hard won victories may be largely symbolic, but necessary to suggest that we are not married to the past and we're not trying to re rewind history and go back to how things were, um, that we will accept some measure of progress. Now it's incomplete. And, um, and with every, again, step towards progress, there are folks that are fighting to push us backwards. But I do think that there are some signs that there is a, a more, uh, that, that there is a, a chance that we can take another step closer to the promise. The question will be, will we make the right choice at those inflection points? And this will matter in who we choose to represent us in Congress and the state houses and the White House. This will uh, be about whether or not we're willing to interact with our fellow citizens that don't look like us, that don't pray like us. Um, will we extend ourselves to build bridges with those folks instead of allowing uh, those with leadership positions to demonize those people and then we sort of fall in lockstep behind them? Uh, will we do the hard work of creating connections to people who also want America to be a place where all of us are, are, are treated equally and where our rights are protected? Or do we think America is a, is a, a finite resource that only a few can enjoy to the exclusion of all others? And uh, depending on which choices the people make will tell us what sort of nation we'll have in the, in the years to come. What a great answer. And um, I, I, I absolutely agree on all the points you just made, particularly the thing that it's not a Southern problem. It's right. not a Black problem. It's an American, it's an American problem. And there was a, there's a story in Willie Morris's book, North Toward Home, um, that uh, when Willie Morris was living in New York City, 
editor of Harper's Magazine, the youngest in history. Um, some of his friends from Mississippi came to visit and they were riding um, in a cab on the way back to Manhattan. And they had a new uh, cabbie from New York and he asked them where they were from. And when they said Mississippi, he went into this racist rant. Mm. And uh, one of Willie's friends looked at him and said, Willie, you know what I really hate? And he said, what's that? And he said, an amateur racist. <laughs> uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> It, yeah, it's it is. Um, you know, I grew up in North Carolina again, and my parents grew up in South Carolina, Georgia. And even in when racial inequality was present, there was a way of life in in the South that it was is just very different from the the ways of life in other places in the country. And the racism that exists is expressed in different ways. Um, a lot of that interpersonal racism, I don't touch on too much in the book uh, because it does have these sort of cultural and regional distinctions, but also because that's not the kind that public policy can combat outright. Um, and the kind of racism when it comes to voting laws or hiring or housing or schools, uh, that kind of racism, we actually find more segregated schools in the Northeast than we find in the South. Uh, more segregated neighborhoods um, by, by money and by race um, in, the, in parts of the urban areas in the north than we find in some of the southern states. So, I mean, to, to your point, like there is, there, there are like, ex, there, there is a sort of modes of racism that are, are different where we go, but the structurally, the impact of it is the same and often it's worse in places that we anticipate, would think are more progressive or, or have a, 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 a cleaner history on race relations than, than other places in the South. And that's uh, uh, turns out not to be true more times than not. Richard? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, there's a question. I'm not sure I quite understand the phrasing, but I believe the question, the person, person asked some question wants to know about the percentage uh, uh, it, of, uh, of, of um, blacks in, in, in the military who are in lower uh, mm. uh, ranks uh, as opposed to those who are officers. What, what is, do you know what the percentage differences are, either of you? Uh, so not, not offhand, I, I know total force as of, I think, 2019, um, something like 16% of service active duty service members were black Americans. I want to say uh, just under 60% or maybe right around 60% or so were white Americans. And then um, um, you get uh, 13, 14% were Hispanic and, uh, and then the remainder sort of Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander. Um, so black Americans are 13% of the country, but 16% of the armed forces would suggest that we're, we're overrepresented in those. But, but the truth is, that when you break that down between officer and enlisted, that most people of color, uh, there are numbers in the service overall, are heavily weighted in the enlisted ranks. Uh, I want to say three in four officers in the military are white Americans, and only one in four are people of color. And I think on Black Americans, it's less than 10%. So there's an, a, a real overrepresentation of Black Americans in enlisted ranks and an underrepresentation of white Americans in enlisted ranks. Whereas national or in the officer ranks, there's an overrepresentation of white Americans there and an underrepresentation of people of color there. So um, that's, that's kind of how it, it roughly breaks. I don't have the exact numbers, but that's sort of the, the, um, the elevator pitch for for uh, racial demographic breakdowns in today's service is, is best thing. I don't have the exact numbers either, but um, there are two issues that, um, that exacerbate this. One is on how we get people into the military mm -hmm. and particularly the officer corps. It comes out of uh, Naval Academy, um, the uh, service academies, ROTC and officer candidate school. Um, there's a, when I was secretary, there, there were 160 schools that were wanting Naval ROTC that didn't have it. And the only two we put it in and put new, new units in were um, Rutgers and Arizona State. And the reason we put it there was that those are the two most diverse campuses in the country. Uh, now, 
also brought it back to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, mm -hmm. where it had been gone for more than 40 years. But the second issue, so, so number one, you don't start out with as many people of color coming in as officers. Uh, and as you know, uh, there, there are some direct promotions from enlisted ranks, but that's not where we get most of, most of our officers. Um, secondly, um, it's a pr promotion problem. Right. People of color are promoted less and less fast than, than others. And the way that officers are promoted, as you're well aware of, are by promotion boards. Mm -hmm. And the Marines have a saying, ducks pick ducks. <laughs> so if you, if you put a bunch of white guys um, or, you know, pick up, pick up white people or infantry only or right. surface warfare in the Navy, that's who you're going to get as promotion to people, promote people who look like themselves. People promote people who've had the same background as they have. And one of the arguments that I always made was a military force that looks alike, thinks alike, has the same background, has the same outlook becomes a very predictable force and a predictable force is a defeatable force. And that's why diversity is not a social experiment. It's not diversity for diversity's sake. It's because it makes us better war fighters. Great. Uh, some, someone wanted to, someone wrote in to, to correct the, the quote about um, uh, the, the fighting man and the, mm, and the I knew I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> William Butler Yates. Well, that's there. We go. According to somebody. <laughs> no, that's right. Maybe. That's right. <laughs> and uh, I, I hate I was, Google. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about um, you know Ray. You mentioned uh, national service, and and you talked about it too, some Ted. That you know there there was a time when national service was. Uh, contemplated and may have been mandatory. Um, and I know that, uh, for instance, uh, Teach for America has been such a successful uh, program here in Mississippi. It's been so uh, good for Mississippi and the, the young people who participate in it uh, seem to benefit from it uh, greatly. Uh, at least that, you know, that's, that's what I hear from them. Um, what, what is your what, what do you all think about, you know, national service and, and how it, what is your uh, vision of a national service that both uh, uh, gets, gets at uh, racism, but also uh, serves the country and its citizens well? Um, if I can start. Um, yes, sir. Absolutely. I have thought for a long, long time that national service would be one of the best things that would happen to this country, but also one of the best things that would happen to the young people of this country. Um, Ted in his book said there were three possible ways that you could get national service. One was um, if you offered incentives and disincentives. Um, so it's purely voluntary. One is if you made it a part of the existing draft structure. And third is if you did universal national service. Um, he said, and, I, and I'm afraid correctly, that the last two just won't, won't happen. But I do think that if you had universal national service, because I, uh, and, I and I think it's important to distinguish national service from military service. We're not talking about everybody going into the military. But uh, Richard, you and I came of age during Vietnam. And, you know, it was an incredibly unfair war. If you didn't want to go, you didn't go. If you were white, if you mm. were connected, if you were well-to-do or your parents were well-to-do. And it was seen as so unfair. It was seen as, you know, not it, one of the reasons that the war never had the support uh, across the country was it was so, the, the way we um, got people into the military was so unfair. And my notion about national service is if, if, you, if I had my absolute druthers and could, could design the system, it would be that everybody goes. There are no exemptions. There are no exemptions for 
of physical disabilities. There are no exemptions for mental disabilities. There are no exemptions, period. Everybody can do something. And it would be things like uh, working in national parks and hospitals. And you know, we have an educational problem in this country. So if you go in and you don't have a high school degree, one of the requirements while you're there is to get one. Uh, and you could use some, some of the other people in national service to do the teaching um, to, to get there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure that's not realistic, but I do think that number one, it would help the country. But number two, I think it would help the people that went through it uh, even, even more. And I think it would get us a long way toward what Ted has been talking about, about national unity and a common purpose, even though we look different and even though we have different beliefs and different ideas and we don't agree all the time about where the country should go, we at least uh, uh, are, are civil to one another and, um, and, and debate these things rationally and not violently. Yeah, and, and I agree. I think one of the biggest, whatever it looks like, we have to ensure that when people serve, they're not just serving in the communities where they grew up. Um, they have to get out of their comfort zone and go and work in places that are unfamiliar to them around Americans they wouldn't otherwise meet. Uh, Teach for America does this. They take kids that go to great schools and put them in, in school systems in Appalachia or in inner cities or in different parts of the country where, where the students are under-resourced or, or, or needing you know, the, the, the talent that these schools produce and as a way of not just exposing students to new teachers, but, but exposing those new teachers to different Americans, to different students. So it's the cross-pollinization uh, that I think makes national service powerful, not just the service-oriented activity, whether it's community-based or national service in the military or, or, or government or, or something like that, but the fact that you're doing that service with folks that you wouldn't otherwise, otherwise come across is, is important. Um, and I think you're, you're right, Mr. Secretary, about universe. it needs to be universal in the sense that uh, people shouldn't be able to buy their way out of this. If national service becomes something that those people who don't have means do in order to pay for college, then all of a sudden it's what the poor kids do to pay for college and the rich kids don't have to do service because they don't need to, to go that route. And that doesn't achieve the aims of national service. It needs to be spread across class, race, ethnicity, region, uh, all these differences in our society in order for it to have its, its greatest effect. You know, We've got a great opportunity to do something like this because in five years we'll be celebrating our 250th national birthday, our, our anniversary. Uh, and what better time than then? to begin thinking about how to institute a program of national service so that we can um, honor the nation's 250th birthday by recommitting ourselves to creating the nation of, our, of its promise and, uh, and building, leaving something for the next generation that was better than what the, the nation we inherited. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take another qu question here. If um, the, the the country has become so divided uh, politically, and uh, it's, it's, I mean, I don't, I think we would all agree that we've never seen in our lives any, anything like what we have now in terms of the, the rancor and uh, the inability, it's, it's, it seems, for uh, uh, different sides to uh, get along or get anything done or agree on anything. And, um, and, and I don't know exactly how to ask the question, but to what extent can, how do you, how would you couch race as an issue in that, in that particular schism? Uh, um, and, 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 and where's the rub and, and where, where do you think that fits in there? And how are we gonna, how can, um, how can that be solved? How can that problem be solved? Yeah, well, one of the biggest issues, as I see it, is, is actually one that the nation has wrestled with from the beginning, and is that uh, there, there is a political reward often awaiting those who will seek to divide the people over issues of race. Um, when the nation was founded, the, the framers of the Constitution, the, the revolutionary generation, and then, uh, you know, a decade later when the, the um, Constitutional Convention happens, 
they had debates about whether or not slavery would be would persist in this new nation, and they decided to allow it to stick around in order to to create the union. And so it was a political decision to hang on to the institution of slavery uh, and in favor of keeping the union. It's a political decision to end the slave trade. It's a political decision to. Um, you know, uh, embark on the Civil War once some uh, once the other states made political decisions to secede, political decisions for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to bring formerly enslaved Black people into the realm of citizenship and voting. And so all along the way up to today, where we have politicians making specific race-based appeals, and frankly, on both sides of the aisle, but certainly um, on a kind of white identity politics that is becoming more prevalent explicitly in our politics, all of this is being fueled by, uh, by leaders who are leading with the race issue on every uh, more than anything else before they talk about climate, taxes, housing, education. It's all about um, either uh, government, using taxpayer money inefficiently and helping people who haven't earned their spot in America before helping those who have who have, have done their due diligence to be good citizens or those who have, have, have not done enough to uh, help those groups who have been left behind for centuries in the nation's public policy to catch up so that they can play on a, a level playing field. And the, instead of bickering or debating on the principle of issues around schooling or fair housing or, or tax structure or whatever, they're debating about who gets help by public policy. Is it going to be white Americans or is it gonna be those people of color? And now that devolves everything into a debate about race such that politicians seeking office often lean on the race issue as a way of, uh, of sort of consolidating their base uh, shoring up their portion of the electorate in hopes that those more of their folks will show up to, to help them win office than, than those who would vote against them. And so to, to the way to work ourselves out of this race thing requires this principled leadership, this transformative leadership that I talked about. But more than that, it requires Americans to recognize all of us are being under-delivered, the, the promise is being under-delivered to all of us when we allow these appeals to racial division to succeed, when we elect people into office who stay there uh, and get reelected by playing into racial division, instead of electing people who want to unify Americans and, and do um, and, and sort of serve us principle, you know, with, with principle, um, we are partly responsible for the government we have. And so it's not just about better leadership, but it's also about uh, the people holding bad leaders accountable and recognizing that the um, exploiting racism for political power, for economic power is un-American and actually destroys the nation for all of us um, under the false promise of allowing some of us to prosper at the expense of others. I, I cannot improve on that answer, and except to, to add one quote, and I don't know who said this, uh, so if anybody's listening and can look it up, but um, somebody once said that the only way to keep a, a person down in a ditch is get down in the ditch with them, mm. uh, which is exactly what you were saying, that everybody um, is ill-served. Mm. When, um, when we divide by, by any sort of immutable characteristics like race and that, um, you know, this, this, and it's fear. It's, it's fear by right. white Americans that they may lose their privileged place that they've occupied for so long, sometimes uh, without even realizing all the privileges that attach just because of skin color. Uh, but, um, I do think the one answer is to hold people accountable and to and to make that sort of appeal uh, a losing political argument. Right, right. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's both of you is a terrific answer to a question that I wasn't really quite sure how to ask. <laughs> but uh, I, I think in closing, uh, Ted, I just want to thank you for this book. Uh, thank you for the work that you put into this and, uh, and the thought. It's uh, Ray and I were talking about it a little bit before, I think before you came on and um, just, just, I mean, not only are your, your ideas and your, and your arguments uh, terrific, but your, your, the quality of the writing is just, mm -hmm. it's just excellent. And um, 
and uh, actually compelling. You, 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 uh, this book really, you know, sucks you in and and takes you along. So uh, thank you for doing just a marvelous job with this book. And and Ray, thank you for uh, coming on today. I, I'll leave leave you each with a parting comment if you like. Yeah. Anything, any last words? Yeah, sure. Just thank you so much for, for having me. And thank you both for, for taking the time to read the book and for, for having me here. I actually will be at the Mississippi Book Festival in Jackson in August. Right. I, I think that's a little bit of ways from Oxford, but if the, the free meal is there, I may, may have to make the trek, uh, <laughs> make the trek there. Um, but most of all, I, I, I do want to leave folks with, I, I, I do think um, what we are asking of our country is something that's never been done before, to create a multiracial, egalitarian, liberal democracy based on a constitution that is over 200 years old. And every time the nation is bumped up against a problem like this, we've figured a way to keep the nation and to make it better on the back end of it, even if it's not been perfect. Uh, Jim Crow, for all of its terribleness, was a slight step, was, was a step up from the institution of slavery. And, and being in the 21st century is much better um, for, for a black man in America like me than, than the 20th century. Uh, I'd much rather be black in 2021 than 1921 or 1821. So the problem is hard, but we have shown, or at least previous generations have shown that they've pushed the country to be closer to the promise over time. I think we can do our part to, to push the country to take that next step. But uh, as John McCain said in his concession speech in 2008, uh, when he lost to President Obama, nothing in America is inevitable. It, it is not a foreordained prophecy. We're not divinely ordained to be the multiracial egalitarian society of our promise. We will have to work for it. And, uh, and if we don't do that work, then we will uh, miss a, a golden opportunity to, to create something new for mankind. So here's the hoping that, uh, that we meet the challenge ahead and that we can stir up the courage to, to take on um, the past and the present to leave something better for posterity. And I'm just very honored to be here, particularly with uh, Commander Theodore R. Johnson. <laughs> and um, um, it, I, I appreciate the book, and as Richard was saying, incredibly well written. A lot of thought went into it, um, but uh, also the the notion of hope. Right. And I think that um, that is one thing that is so precious we cannot give up on, uh, if not for ourselves, for our children. Right. Thank you both, and. Uh... Be well and good night. Thank you. Okay.